So the whole idea of any, any spiritual process is to change our consciousness, to change how we perceive things, how we interact with things, with the idea that then our life becomes spiritualized and that when our life becomes spiritualized, our next destination is also spiritual. That's, you could say, the essence of any kind of religion or spiritual process has this concept that although we're living in the world, we're living in the world differently than a materialistic person. And if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is really centered on, Arjuna says, if I want to be a spiritual person, I need to retire from my job. <laughs> yeah? I'm actually talking with one devotee right now who's saying, you know, I think the best way I can do my spiritual life, he's only like 40, is to retire from my job and move to a holy place. So this is a very common way of thinking, that I need to externally withdraw from the world. Especially when the world presents us with some difficulty, which is what's going on in the Bhagavad Gita. It's a pretty severe difficulty. It's actually a war. Uh, hopefully none of us here have been in a war. But it's a war, and it's not only a war, it's a civil war. And Arjuna is pitted. He has relatives on his side and relatives he's fighting against. And he says, this is too painful. It's too difficult. It's going to result in sin. I'm not even going to enjoy the kingdom if I win. It's not compassionate, and so forth and so on. So better I just walk away. Better I forget the whole thing. And we could say that the essence of what's going on in the Bhagavad Gita is Krishna telling Arjuna, no, you stay in your position. As Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also says, Stani Sita, you stay in your position, but you work in a different consciousness. You work in a different frame. And it takes Arjuna quite a while to understand this. So Arjuna keeps pushing for this idea that I have to withdraw. And Krishna uses words like booty yoga, which translate to Arjuna that I should just kind of sit around and cultivate philosophy. And he even says, I, how are you, why do you want me to fight if you want me to do booty yoga? How did these things go together? And finally, you know, if somebody really pushes for something, you might say, all right, all right, all right, we can do that. You understand? Yes, Srila Prabhupada tells the story that when one of his children was very young, he wanted to touch a fan. And in those days in India, the fans didn't have a grate over them. It was just open blades. And so he said he asked, Prabhupada said he asked some of his friends what to do, and his friend said, slow the speed and let him touch it. So that's what he did, and the child touched, and then Prabhupada said, touch again, and he said, no, no. <laughs> no, no. So sometimes when someone's very insistent, we may say, all right, well, here it is. So that's what happened. Arjuna kept insisting. And so therefore, Krishna in chapter 6 starts describing a kind of yoga where you do withdraw from the world. He says, all right, go to a holy place. You know, don't have anything to do with your wife Draupadi or Subhadra. Don't eat nice food anymore. You know, Arjuna was a prince, so don't eat royal food. Don't wear royal clothes anymore. Just sit in the forest, stare at the tip of your nose, and chant Om. And Arjuna says, Chanchalahimana Krishna, I, I don't think, my mind is jumping too much. Do you all have this thing? Does your mind jump? Yes. So Arjuna says, my mind jumps too much. It's not going to work. And then he says, ah, oh, what happens if someone tries this and fails? <laughs> so by presenting this scenario to Arjuna, Arjuna himself comes to reject it. By the way, that's a very good tactic if you're dealing with someone. And at the end of that chapter, Krishna says, anyone know the verse at the end? You can say it with me if you know. Good. Yoginam apisarvesham madgaten antaratmana shradavam bhajate yomam samayuktatamomataha. The best yogi is one who's always absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. So the next thing would be, well, how do you do that? How do you absorb yourself in thoughts of Krishna? And so we might think that Krishna is going to say, right after he says this, all right, just think of me in Vrindavan playing the flute. Right? But he doesn't. It's fascinating that what Krishna says right after this, as you can see, we're going to look at chapters 7, 9, 10, and 15, 
What Krishna says right after this in chapter 7 is how to find Krishna in the things of this world. Now, why would he do that? Obviously, we also want to think of Krishna in his abode. After all, he already said in chapter 4, Janma Karma Chame Divya, think of my various activities. However, it's extremely difficult to always think about how Krishna's playing his flute to call the cows and and how Mother Yasoda is feeding him and how he's dancing with the God. That's very difficult. We're thinking, oh, no, I need to pay this bill. Why did they bill me for this? They shouldn't have billed me for this. That's a mistake. I have to call the company. Oh, and the car needs to be repaired. And my kid has to go to school. They have a test today. Did they finish? Those things are also going to be there if we're working in the world, which is why Arjuna had this idea of separating himself from the world. Now, let's say we could take all of these things that we're thinking about and see how they're related to Krishna, see how Krishna is present in them. Then if we're also aware of Krishna's pastimes beyond this world, what will happen is the things in this world, when we see how they're related to Krishna, will bring us to Krishna's pastimes in the spiritual world. Okay, you ready for this journey? We did this before. How many of you were here for the Bhagavatam section that we did a few weeks ago? Okay, so you're ready for the Bhagavad Gita one? Yes? All right, so the same thing is I want you, if you can, you can take notes. That's a good idea. And as we're going through, I'd like you to pick one, two, maximum three specific things here that you're going to meditate on at least today and tomorrow and maybe over the next week. And as I said, for those of you who stay to the end, we have a special surprise at the end. All right? So we're going to start with chapter 7. So here Krishna says, I am Om. And this he says three times. So we know that this whole creation comes from sound. And that sound is Om. And uh, I'm sure you know the scientists tell us that even solid matter is not completely solid. The atoms are moving, the molecules are moving. Movement means vibration. And actually everything is vibrating this om. But Krishna says he's not only om, but he's all sounds. Well, this is one I like to meditate on because I find it very challenging. We've got the air conditioner. A few rustling can't hear the cars right now. But how is that Krishna? There's one class where Srila Prabhupada says that if you don't want to chant Hare Krishna, you can meditate on how all sounds are Krishna. Does anyone remember from the Bhagavatam one where these sounds come from? Yeah? Where do they come from? What part of Krishna's body? Anybody remember? His ears, excellent. And so I like to, you know, I'll hear a car, a car honking and a baby crying and a dog barking and someone's phone beeping and, oh, that's all coming from Krishna's ears. I am the seed. This is another one that Krishna says three times. So bhakti is often compared to a seed, right? That the guru, it, he plants the seed of bhakti in the heart. It gets watered with hearing and chanting and produces fruits and flowers at the lotus feet of the Lord. And righteous romance, when we see people who are happily, lovingly married, producing children with love and affection and care, that is Krishna. And the strength of the strong, devoid of passion and desire, when we use our strength to protect others, or we see others using their strength to protect and care for others, that is Krishna. And the heat in fire. Can we all become aware of the heat in this room? Mm-hmm. One time I remember reading that this one scientist said that the universe is a cold, impersonal machine. But actually our lives are full of heat. And heat is indicative of life. And it's indicative of love. We talk about a warm embrace. Right? The opposite of like a cold glance. 
And whenever we are, can become aware that we're surrounded by heat, heat's coming from our body in the surrounding, that is Krishna's loving, living embrace. The fragrance of the earth. Does anyone remember what part of Krishna's body this comes from? Anyone remember from the other class? Yeah? His nose, yes. So all of the fragrances, you know, we have now that the gardens are blooming. Here's one fragrance in the chrysanthemum. I'm in a little clove here in the carnation, and then rose. And how is it that all these flowers are growing in the same dirt, with the same water and the same sun, but such a variety of fragrance? Prabhupada one time said that even if you don't read the scripture and you don't have a guru, you can find God in the fragrance of a flower. The penances of the ascetics. So what is penance? Penance means we've done something wrong and we do something to fix it. We put things back into balance. And the ascetics are people who've dedicated their lives to putting things back into balance. Some of you are familiar with the Chatur Shloki, the four main verses of the Bhagavatam that the Lord speaks to Brahma upon which the whole Bhagavatam is built. Right before these four verses, Krishna says something astonishing. He says, Tapo me ridayam sakshat. Penance is directly sakshat, my ride, my heart. And atmaham tapaso, atma aham, myself is penance. The most basic kind of penance is an apology. So a genuine apology, is that easy or hard? Very hard, right? This was several months ago, one devotee I know wrote on social media, my authorities told me to write a genuine apology, so if any of you are so sensitive that you were offended by what I said, I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> Whenever we genuinely do penance for our wrongs, that is Krishna the life of all that lives. I'd like us to become aware that we are alive, to feel our aliveness, to feel I am alive, and then to become aware that everyone else in this world also is feeling this sense of being alive. And throughout the world, the insects, the trees, the animals, they all have this sense of being alive. The world is full of aliveness. And this sense of being alive is Krishna. So all of us have some intelligence. And you know what it's like when we do something intelligent, right? We go, whoa, that was smart. Right? That sense of doing something smart, that's Krishna. Prowess or tejaha. So this is skilled strength. Skilled strength. Whenever we see somebody using strength that has some skill, that is Krishna. The light of the sun. This is something else Krishna says three times. So light, right? We have, although the sun's so far away and we only have some little windows here, still, even if we turned off all the lights here, still the room would be full of sunlight. It brings us certainty, it brings us relief, it removes our fears. And we, we tend to just take it for granted that our, our room, our outside is full of light, but that is Krishna and the light of the moon and cooling and soothing after the long day. And ability, this is a wonderful one to meditate on, such an easy thing to meditate on. We are always using some ability. We all have the ability to sit, we're able to hear, to see. If you try wiggling your fingers and toes and think, how am I doing that? And anything we're doing, that is Krishna. And whenever we see anyone having any ability, that is Krishna. This is one, of course, Srila Prabhupada talked about a lot, in the taste of water. Yeah. Actually, this is any liquid substance. 
Rasoham up sukam teya, that rasa, that taste. And Prabhupada would say, what is the difficulty to think of Krishna? Uh, one time actually in, um, in Taiwan or Hong Kong, one of those places, Tokyo, Tokyo, it was Tokyo. This one boy was asking Prabhupada, how do I see God? And Prabhupada said, you see him as he is telling you to see him. See him in the light of the sun and see him in the taste of water. All right, so we did chapter 7. Now we're going to go to chapter 9. So I am the ritual. Right? So everybody has some rituals in their life. Do you all have some rituals in your life? I was hearing someone the other day. They said, okay, I put on both my socks and both my shoes, but my wife puts on her left sock, then her left shoe, and her right sock, and then her right shoe. Right? You go to one person's house, they put the cups over here and the dishes over here, and someone else's house, they put the cups over here and the dishes over there. So we have so many rituals we do in Krishna consciousness, but these are all coming from Krishna's desire. Just like where a person puts things, how they put things, is indicative of their desire. And Krishna and his desire are the same. And the sacrifice. So sacrifice means a ceremony of connection. Huh? So we all do ceremonies of connection. Hmm? So usually when I teach this, I talk about what ceremony I have to do if I'm going to call my daughter. But since I'm right here, it's, I just say hello to her. I don't have to call her. Uh, but if, I, if I'm in another part of the world and I want to call her, then I have to do a ceremony, right? I have to have a phone, and the phone has to be on a network, and it has to be charged, and I have to put in the right number, and I have to think about the time zone, Right? I don't want to call her at one in the morning, or I might not make a connection. So in the same way, many kind of yagyas are like that. You have to do them at the right time, in the right place, with the right mantras. And if you say the mantra slightly wrong, then instead of getting someone who's going to kill Indra, you get someone who Indra kills. Right? <laughs> now, these different yagyas are also indicators of the way Krishna wants to be connected with. Like I have some people, they only want email, some people only want WhatsApp, some people only want messengers, some people I've got to call them on the phone. So Krishna has his ways and he wants us to connect with him. And he's the offering to the ancestors. Uh, Krishna wants us to respect our elders and he wants us to keep up the uh, pious cultures of our family. And the healing herb, anybody remembers what, parts, uh, what part of Krishna's body are the healing herbs and drugs? Hairs, yes, and the potency comes from his what? Anybody remember? Yes, in the back, yes? His breath, yes. So Krishna's breath is giving the potency to the herbs, which are the, his hairs. Uh -huh. And how amazing it is when we're sick and we take some herb or we even you take pharmaceuticals derived from herbs and then you just feel better. I said, wow, right? because that potency is Krishna. And of course, if Krishna is all sounds, how much is he the sound of his holy name? So not only is he the ritual and the yagya, he is also all of the ingredients. And he's the father. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's actually, I don't remember if that's Abhimanyu or Nisinga shoes and Sri Arjuna shoes in that picture. <laughs> So every, every religion understands that God is the Father. Yes. So all of us have fathers. Hopefully we have good relationships with our fathers. Many of you here are fathers. Every day we're seeing so many fathers. And if we take the ideal father, right, who loves his children, who provides for their education, for their protection, for their maintenance, for their recreation... And we multiply that billions and billions of times. We'll have some idea what is Krishna. And not only is he the father, he's the mother. So we grow inside the body of our mother. We're nourished from the body of our mother. Similarly, we all are coming from the body of Krishna and are nourished by Krishna. And just like a mother will love her child even if the child becomes a criminal, isn't it? Right? The child's a serial killer and the mother's still cares about him. 
So even if we are evil, even if we are wayward, even when we make mistakes, Krishna never stops loving all of us. And the support. So what supports us? Our house, right? Our job. How do you support yourself? You talk about your job, emotionally, our family, our community. Can all of those crumble? Yeah, <laughs> but Krishna never crumbles. And the grandfather. So when we do a yagya, and they ask us what family we're in, we say, Achyuta Gotra, right? We're in Krishna's family. And Prabhupada says that the grandfather is often more affectionate than the father. The object of knowledge. I once read this scientist said, if you study nature a little bit, you could be an atheist. But if you study it deeply, you have to become atheist. The more that we study everything around us, the more we can understand the presence of Krishna. And the purifier, we do so many things to be purified. We take a bath, we wash our clothes, we clean our house, we try to eat healthy, we exercise, maybe we take medical treatments or psychological treatments. But the active principle in all these purifying agents is Krishna. And again, he says he is Om. So Om seems so simple. One syllable, Om, how is that God? And similarly, Krishna seems very simple. Lord Brahma made this mistake. He thought, oh, he's a little boy, and only a little boy. He has food in his left hand. You know, Veda culture, you eat with your right hand. So he's got food in his left hand, walking around. Where's my friends? Yeah. So similarly, we may say, Om, oh, oh, very, very simple. How can it be God? But actually, uh, everything is contained there. And I am the goal. Srila Prabhupada says that if our mind is not satisfied, that's for want of a goal. When we are making goals, working toward them, achieving them, there is Krishna and the sustainer. So what sustains us? Air, temperature, water, food, those we love. But actually, it's Krishna sustaining us through all of those. If we are physically, emotionally, creatively, socially sustained, it is actually Krishna sustaining us. And I am the master. So this is not a popular concept in 2024, masters. So how many of you have ever had a really good boss? How many of you have had a really good boss ever in your life? It's always a small number. <laughs> and so whenever I've worked under a really good boss, you just feel so relaxed, right? There's one story this one Christian author tells that he and his wife and his two kids were going out and they put the kids in their car seat, and they get in the car, and they stop at a grocery store, and the wife gets out, buys some things, comes back in, stop at a gas station, he gets out, pumps the gas, gets back in. They stop at a friend's house, his wife drops off some of the groceries at their friend's house. Then they're going too fast on the highway, and the police pulls them over, comes to the window, gives them a ticket, and they're driving, and then his three-year-old daughter says, Daddy, where are we going? And he was thinking, we've been in this car for 45 minutes. And from a three-year-old's perspective, you know, we stop someplace, mommy gets out, we're waiting, she gets back in, we stopped another place, daddy gets out, he's doing something funny with the car, and he gets in, and we stop at another place, and mommy gets out, and then we stop another place, this strange man with lights is coming to the car. So he doesn't know what's going on. But still, she's just happy in the car. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know where they're going. But what does she know? Who is driving? Who is driving? I am the witness. So people don't like this one either. God always knows what you're doing. <laughs> but it's not like that. So you can try an experiment. You can go to someone who loves you, genuinely loves you, and say, I'd like to talk to you for two hours about everything I did today. I think after five minutes, their mind would wander, right? But Krishna's actually interested. He's interested in everything we think, everything we feel, everything we desire. And sometimes we get to, to, to see that, isn't it? Right? So I should tell you this story. So... Aditya Narayanpu was saying about the greenhouse, but I also, with your help, take care of Rinda Devi's garden. And I was just thinking last week, 
I thought, you know, I'd like to get another bird sculpture for Vrinda's garden. And there may be some more solar lights. Maybe I should get some more solar lights. Maybe I should buy some. I don't know. Should I get some of the same kind? And I was looking at some stuff online. And then two days ago, Haribo, Ermila. And it's Guru Bhakta. And she said, I brought you a peacock sculpture for the garden and another four solar lights. And then you know that Krishna is listening, right? Right? Has this kind of thing happened to you? Yes. So he's the witness. And not only in this life, but forever. I am the abode. So how do we feel when we get home? Right? I can relax. I can be myself. But Krishna is everywhere, and we can always relax and be our authentic selves in him. And this is something to think about every time you open the door to your house. And the refuge. So Prabhupada says in Bhagavatam 321.17 purport that Krishna is like an umbrella. He's an umbrella against the sun and the rain of the material energy. So whenever we find some refuge, whenever we get in the shade, whenever we find some cover for the rain, we can remember that Krishna is our refuge and the most dear friend. So hopefully all of us have at least one good friend. And what does it mean to have a friend? Someone we feel some sense of equality with, that we have their back, they have our back, we do fun things together, we understand each other. And if we could take that out to infinity to understand how much Krishna is our friend. So the creation and the annihilation. So we are generally very fascinated with both creation and annihilation. Like, you know, how children build things out of blocks, and then what do they do? They knock them over. Yeah. There's uh, one woman who makes her living by knocking over blocks. She makes videos of building block towers, like with dominoes, and then knocking one, and they all go over in beautiful designs, and that's how she maintains herself. Uh, because we're all fascinated by creation and annihilation. And basis of everything. Sectarianism means when we tell the story of our life or the story of the world without reference to the Supreme. But actually, under our joys, our triumphs, our tragedies, our sorrows, our creativity, all of our life's adventure, Krishna is always the basis. I really like this one, and I really like getting these pictures. The resting place. Mm -hmm. This can be physical when we sit down on a bench, we sit on a chair, we take a break. Our mental resting places where we go for inner space and privacy. Wherever we rest, we can always think, Krishna is really my resting place. This is something I think about every night when I lie down in my bed. Uh, Krishna is the resting place. And again, he says that he's the seed. So in most of the world, the primary food that people eat is seeds. Wheat, rice, right? barley, millet, quinoa. You know. See, also all the beans, legumes, even a lot of the spices, they're all seeds. This is the place where all the nutrition is packed into the plant. And Krishna is this concentrated force of energy as the seed. And he gives heat. So you know when you're cooking, the heat is making the molecules dance. Yeah? That's why if you hang your clothes outside in the sun, it will dry because the heat from the sun makes the molecules of water on your clothes dance away from your clothes, actually. <laughs> And the food, when we're cooking, not only are the molecules dancing, but the flavor is changing and the juices are coming out. So when we see Krishna, we start to dance and our flavor changes and our heart starts to melt. I withhold and send forth the rain. I can't remember how old I was, maybe 10. And we were driving on the road and on our side of the road it was raining and on the other side it wasn't raining. Right down the line. I can still see that. It, was, it made such an impression on me as a child. Have you ever seen a cloud in the distance? It's raining in one place, right? You can see where the rain is coming down. So when our oldest son was about one year old, we lived in an ashram in Boston, and there was a sink in the corridor. 
And so our son would take containers and he'd go to the sink and he'd hold up the container, anyone who went by, and he'd say, water, water, water. And so they would, people would give him water. And then what would he do with the water? And then what would he do? And the devotees would come to me and say, your son is making a mess. Why do you give him water? I said, I'm not giving him water. You're giving him water. I said, but he comes up to us, water, water. So sometimes Krishna turns on the tap and sometimes he turns it off. Immortality and death. Actually, I was just hearing Prabhupada talk about this this morning, how that everybody meets Krishna in the form of death. And we're very afraid of death because death takes away our identity in this world. So when I first joined the movement, we used to have this drama called the wrong bank account. So you may know that you can't take money out of someone else's account, but you can put money into someone else's account if you have the routing number and the bank account number. So we had this drama that this man, after he would get out of work e each week and get his paycheck, he would put money into the account, but somehow he got one number wrong, and he was putting it into someone else's account. And when he went to withdraw his money, there was nothing there. So generally in this life, we're putting our energy, our thought, our care into this body, into this mind, into this world. And death means all that is gone. So therefore, we're very afraid of death. But death is actually Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada gives the analogy of a cat. And we have a cat on this property. And the, this cat catches mice, I know, because sometimes the cat leaves the mice outside my door as a present. Aww, yeah. So, <laughs> right, if the cat's carrying a kitten, the kitten is feeling safe. The kitten is thinking, oh, my mommy is carrying me. But when the mouse or the rat is in the kitten's mouth, it's feeling distressed. So the devotee sees death as here is my Lord coming to get me. Because not only is Krishna death, but Krishna is also immortality. Beyond this body, this identity, uh, we are immortal and there is Krishna. Okay, we've looked at chapter 7 and 9. Now we're going to look at chapter 10. Beginning, the middle, and the end of all beings, our childhood, our youthfulness, our middle age, our old age. Again, the sun. Actually, Everything here is a transformation of sunlight. The plants are taking the sun and turning it into sunlight and turning it into food, and we're eating it, and our bodies are really transformations of sunlight, and this wood and the trees, and everything is simply transformed sunlight. A little less, Krishna, is the light of the sun right now. Okay, sure. And among the stars, I am the moon. So we see the moon surrounded by stars, and we can remember Krishna eating surrounded by his cowherd boys or dancing surrounded by the gopis. Of the senses, I am the mind. So many times we yogis think of the mind as just troublesome. But actually it's the control center of the senses, and in that way represents Krishna. Srila Prabhupada writes that there's nothing we can think, feel, and desire that is outside the range of Krishna's energy. And when we use that thinking, feeling, and desire for Krishna, we realize that the mind can be our friend. And he is the living force, consciousness, our awareness. If we can stop and become aware that we are aware, we are aware of where our feet are, we are aware of where our ears are, even if we close our eyes, we have a sense of how much space is in front of us, behind us, and to the sides. And everyone in this room is similarly aware. Actually, all living entities are aware. This world is full of awareness or consciousness, and that is Krishna. Of all the rudras, he is Shiva. Yeah, so Lord Shiva is in charge of destruction and he's in charge of the troublemakers in the universe. So I have one god brother, he's now retired, but he used to be a physician in the maximum security prison for the criminally insane. Imagine having that as your job. 
So that's what Lord Shiva does in the universe. And of bodies of water, I am the ocean. Anybody remember what part of Krishna's body is the ocean? His, his, his waist, yeah. Right? And when you see the, the ocean moving, you can meditate how Krishna is dancing. Right? So the ocean, it's so, we were at the ocean just a little while ago. I mean, it's just a, about three-hour drive from here, right, to get to the ocean. And the ocean is so deep and so vast and it looks very homogeneous, but actually it's full of varieties of life. Similarly, Krishna is deep and vast, and he may seem very simple, but he's full of variety of pastimes and devotees. And again, he says he is Om. So Srila Jiva Goswami explains, and Srila Prabhupada reiterates this in Chaitanya Charitamrita, that Om is made of A, U, Om. A is Krishna. We'll see a little later. Krishna says, I am A. U is Srimati Radharani, and the M, or the Anushvar, is all of the living entities. And then he is, of all the yagyas, so he is all yagyas, and he is especially japa. Uh, why is that? So we were talking about the other yagyas, you have to do them a certain way, a certain time, and if you just get one thing a little bit off, you say an uh instead of an ah, then the whole meaning is changed. But chanting the holy name you can do in the morning, in the evening, in your car, in the shower, when you're clean, when you're dirty, when you're mad, when you're glad, whatever's going on, you can do it silently in your mind, quietly, loudly, in a kirtan. You can connect with Krishna always. And the Himalayas, we don't have any Himalayas here. Uh, we just have some hills in Hillsboro. Uh, <laughs> anybody remember what part of the Lord's body are the mountains? There's bones, yes. yes. So the Himalayas don't move like Krishna is immovable in his love for us. And banyan trees, of course, we don't have any of those around here either. How many of you have seen a real banyan tree? Pretty much everybody. All right, so it's very hard to tell where it begins, where it ends, spreads everywhere. And the king, so we're still fascinated in 2024, not sure why, with kings. So many people watched the coronation, I mean, I didn't, of King Charles. So how much more interesting would be Krishna, the king of kings? And the lightning, lightning that pulls nitrogen out of the atmosphere and brings it into the ground as a weapon. So sometimes we're full of sadness or doubts or difficulties or confusion, and then we get this lightning bolt of understanding that acts like a weapon that dissipates our difficulty. And the sura bikau, Krishna is called Eko Bhaganam Yo Vidadati Kaman. He has been fulfilling the desires of everyone since time immemorial. The Sarabis can give unlimited milk and, in fact, whatever one desires. So there are many reasons why people have children, but of all of those reasons, Krishna says that he is the love between the husband and wife. And he is Yamaraj. Anybody remember what part of the Lord's body is Yamaraj? Backside is, Im is immorality. Good. That's very good. But Yamaraj. Anybody remember? His teeth. Good. <laughs> crunching, crunching. Uh, whenever we hear about sinful criminal people getting punished, right, then we know that there's harmony in the universe. Krishna crunching in his teeth. Right, sometimes it seems that bad people are enjoying, good people are suffering. But we know that beyond everything, there is justice. There is Yamaraj. And time so we try to use time, beat time, save time, look forward in time. <laughs> Sometimes we waste time. <laughs> time wears away everything. But if we're offering everything to Krishna in the now, Krishna, this is for you. Krishna, this is for you. This is, and time cannot actually take away anything. And the lion, when the lion roars, all the animals runs away. Like when Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita, the atheist and the demoniac run away. And the wind, you hang your clothes outside, right? And they smell so fresh. You open up a musty room and the wind airs it out. And the wind bringing changes in our life. Anybody know what part of the body, Krishna's body, the wind's coming from? Anyone remember? His breath, yes, yeah, coming from his nostrils. Parasaram, who roots out corruption. In government, whenever we see anybody rooting out corruption in government, we can remember Parasaram. Now Krishna says he's the makara. 
and there's not really an English word for makara. So Prabhupada will usually translate it as shark, sometimes as dolphin, sometimes as crocodile, the great beast of the sea. And the Ganges River, Mother Ganga, that spiritual water that comes from beyond the universe by the piercing of the covering of the universe with the toenail of Vamandev, Padanaka Nira Janita Janapavana. And the beginning, the middle, and the end, the top of the sandwich, the middle of the sandwich, the bottom of the sandwich, the beginning of your journey, your destination, you're coming back home, the start of a project, the doing the project, the winding it up, the planning for a festival, the having a festival, the cleaning it up, the science of knowing the self. So who is the self? We're part and parcel of Krishna. Mamai vamso jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana. We have the qualities of Krishna, maybe to a minute degree, but we're very minute. So we're beautiful. We're ever youthful. We're geniuses. We're effulgent. And therefore Krishna says in 620 that once you know the self, you think there's nothing greater than that. You won't be disturbed by anything and always established in the truth. And he is vada. So vada means when we have discussions because we want truth. Yes. We park our ego with our shoes. And it's about finding truth. Then there's jalpa. Jalpa, I'm not interested in truth. I want to win. Like I was having this discussion on and on with this one devotee. And after a while I said, what do you want? She says, I want you to say that I am right. That's jalpa. And Vitanda, we're not looking for truth or being right. We just want to make the other person wrong. So there's Vada, Jalpa, and Vitanda. And here Krishna says he is a. Uh. So this sound, a, uh, you can say, a, uh, a, uh, a. Uh. It's the most basic sound. You're not using your tongue, your lips, your teeth. That's the foundation of all language. So good times come, good times go, but always there is Krishna at all times. All devouring death, so not just the final death, but the death of relationships, the death of a home, the death of a project, the death of an idea. When uh, Bamandev went to Bali Maharaj and asked him for charity, and Sukrachari was telling him not to give it, Bali said, better to give now whatever the Lord is going to take anyway at the time of death. And my mother used to say that the last year of her life, my mother gave away almost all of her possessions. She said, better to give with a warm hand than a cold hand. <laughs> so if we do that, if I give my relationship to Krishna, if I give my home to Krishna, if I give my career to Krishna, if I give my project to Krishna, then when it's over, he's, I already gave it to him. And there's no sting. This I really like. This is the start before the start. So sometimes something happens and you... Oh, this actually started two months ago when I read that book. Or it started three years ago when I met that person. But I didn't know at the time that that was the start. So the start before the start. The fame of women, very famous women like Gantari, Sita, Draupadi. Sri, which means fortune, but also beauty. So, of course, Krishna is the most beautiful woman in the form of Mohini. Yes. But the beauty of women is also... Krishna. Uh, one time Prabhupada was talking with a group of people. One guest was there, one young girl, young, young woman. And Prabhupada said, yes, you are very beautiful. Use that beauty in Krishna's service. And find speech. So actually in Bhagavatam 957, this Sudarshan Chakra is called the master of speech. That which illuminates, that which destroys ignorance. And when women are speaking like that, that is Krishna. And memory, um, Prabhupada describes this as the ability to read many books and really understand them. Right? So when a woman is remembering, okay, this child wants this and that child, and I have this thing to do today, and I have to do that. That is Krishna. And Meda. So what is the famous verse about Lord Chaitanya that has the word Meda? To Meda Saha, good Meda. Uh, so if you have good Meda, you will join in Sankirtan. And Prabhupada writes in teachings of Queen Kunti uh, for verse 3 that generally in religious functions, the women outnumber the men. I think here we have about 50-50 today. Yeah. And that is, he says, because women have a natural intelligence to accept the supremacy of the Lord. So that intelligence of women is Krishna. Steadfastness. 
the faithfulness of women, the chastity of women, like Draupadi, that is Krishna, and patience. Huh? So how many of you are mothers? How many mothers do we have here? So do you have to be patient with your children? I say you have three choices. You have to be patient, you go crazy, or you let someone else watch them. That's, okay, now the men, you don't listen to this. Do you have to be patient with your husbands too? Yes. So that's Sukanya, which I a Muni. So this patience of women is Krishna. And of poetry, the Gayatri, those of us who chant the Gayatri every day, that is Krishna in the form of a poem. And he is November, December. This is the harvest season. So what's our Gaudiya Vaishnava harvest festival? Govardhan Puja. And flower-bearing spring, which is what we're in right now, of course. Right, this explosion of color and fragrance. It's the youthfulness of the seasons. Uh, actually, Krishna's name Madhava means the husband of the goddess of fortune, but Madhava also means spring. Right, those of us who put on tilak, we say, Om Madhavaya Namaha. And I like to meditate on how Krishna is personified spring. And the gambling of cheats. So this is an interesting one. So in mostly in cheating, you don't know you're cheated until later, correct? <laughs> right? They call it a con man, someone who wins your confidence, you think they're okay, and then your bank account's empty. You're like, what happened? But in gambling, it's open. Okay, let's sit at the table, and I'm going to try to cheat you, and you're going to try to cheat me. That's a very strange kind of cheating. Of the splendid, I am the splendor. This is the wow factor in anything. Srila Rupa Goswami explains when describing the seven secondary rasas in the northern ocean of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that this adbhuta ras has to exist any time we're experiencing any kind of pleasure from anything. There has to be some extent of this wow, this wonder, and this wow factor in anything is Krishna. And I am victory, that sense of woohoo, we won, that's Krishna. And adventure, actually Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur writes that if we see this world as also part of Krishna's lila, our whole life is an adventure. And the strength of the strong, so he's not only the strength of the strong when used properly, He's all strength, right? And we remember in the Bhagavatam, we were reading how the demoniac soldiers, they represent this prowess of the Lord. And we're coming up to Nisingadev's appearance day. And Lord, Lord Nisingadev, what did Haranyakashipu ask Prahlad Maharaj before Nisingadev appeared? Where do you get your superhuman power from? And what did Prahlad say? Same place you get it from. And punishment, right? When the, the murderers and the thieves are punished, uh, that allows us to walk safely down the street, and that is Krishna. This is a really interesting one. So, you know, we don't always win life's battles, right? Sometimes we lose... But you know, sometimes when we've lost a battle in life, but we kept our principles, we kept our ideals, didn't that feel like a kind of victory? Yeah? That's Krishna. And silence. And Prabhupada says in this purport, this is to 1038, among the confidential activities of hearing, thinking, and meditating, silence is most important because by silence one can make progress very quickly. Are you going to miss my surprise? I'm almost there. I, I, I got something really special. I'm on slide 122 of 136, and then I've got something really special at the end. <laughs> so not only that intelligence, but that wisdom, that realization, that deep understanding and again, he says he's the seed. Now, this is the seed of everything. The seeds of our relationships, our projects, our ideas. And this is a wonderful one to meditate on. There's so many beautiful things in this world, so many amazing things in this world. But this is just one planet among countless, among more than one universe. And if we put that all together, it would only be a spark 
of how wonderful Krishna is. So we looked at 7, 9, 10, and there's a few in 15. The splendor of the sun, the beauty of the sunrise, beauty of the sunset, the glory of noon, the splendor of the moon looking like a pearl in the sky, reflecting like diamonds on the water, the splendor of fire. We like to watch fire dancing. Yes. The pilot of the planet. You know, when we're in a vehicle, we can feel it moving. Do you feel the world moving? How amazing is Krishna? The flavors to all the vegetables. The fire of digestion. Right? Like this morning I had some idlis, and now they've become my nose. How does he do that, you know? You eat a japati and it becomes your fingernails. And then he's joining with the prana, moving the food from our mouth to our esophagus, to our stomach, to our small intestines, throughout our body. And here is Bhagavad Gita 15.15. Sarvasya cha hamridi sanni vistom matas matir gyanam apohanam cha. So this is one of my family's favorite verses. So whenever anybody would lose something, we'd say, just chant 15-15. Mata, I can't find my other sock. Well, just chant 15-15. Sarvasya cha hamridi sani vistom matas matir gyanam apohanam cha. I found it. <laughs> so I was traveling once, and one of my friends said to me, Ermila, I can't find my phone. And I said, well, just chant 15-15. So she said, 15-15, 15-15. <laughs> So thank you very much. Anything good in this presentation is due to Srila Prabhupada. Anything bad here is due to me. I hope that you can take the good and leave aside the bad. Thank you. Hare Krishna.